everyone. So the plan this week had originally been to do Nintendo Bar Retrospectives episode, but I ran into some hard drive computer problems, and I'm currently in the middle of restoring from a backup. Um, so that's dedicating my computer resources at this time. But something happened for me to talk about in regards to a video I did two weeks ago, which I recorded technically a week prior to that, about the whole Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition system rest and reference document and OGL mess. So, to start this off, as I started the earlier video off, and this will be just blog, vlog style because, again, restoring from backup doesn't necessarily have the system resources available to do the same degree of video uh, of digging for editing. But in any case, to start this video off, much as the last video did, well, that escalated quickly. We, when I recorded that video, or in between when I recorded it and when it went live, Wizards of the Coast had put out the OGL 1.2 and started a survey period to get feedback on that. Uh, 1.2, as I'd mentioned in annotations on the video itself, or uh, sub uh, captions in the video itself, rolled back some of the more, some, but not all of the more noxious elements of the um, 1.1 version. It rolled back the royalty payment aspect of it. Pro it was probably one of the bigger ones. But on the other hand, it kept in place existing policies and rules regarding uh, in particular, it kept their vaguely enough worded morality clause where, like, Look, I appreciate wizards wanting to keep Nazis from publishing D and D material, D and D compatible material, um, but it was worded in the kind of way where it could very easily also get turned around by a future administration of Hasbro on LGBT creators. Indeed, some LGBT creators have had problems with um, content that was risque at a level that that matched other works that had been accepted, and probably with official art and official books, getting pulled or blocked from getting published on Dungeon Master's Guild because the content in question was LGBT-related content as opposed to um, just looking from a heteronormative perspective. Put it that way. So there's that existing issue, and again, we're in a world right now where... There are far-right hate groups protesting drag clubs and sending death threats to libraries over um, drag queen, read with a drag queen um, day uh, events when we're all, when these libraries are also in turn try, trying to, they're doing these because of also the very success and visibility of stuff like RuPaul's Drag, Way, drag Race, which has brought Dragon to the mainstream. So, it is not unreasonable for LGBT creators to be legitimately concerned that five, ten years down the road under the OGL, that under some change in management in Hasbro, they might decide, oh, we... having this LGBT-friendly content is not in favor of our corporate image, and so we're going to push back on that or prohibit it from getting published through... Dungeon Master's Guild, or otherwise revoke the license from it. And on top of that, the provisions remained under there as well, saying that they could change the license at any time with only 30 days notice, which still ain't great if you're a publisher. It's not good. 30 days is not a good window to, you know, rework stuff you have in the pipeline, particularly with supply chains being how they are and books potentially being in the middle, in transit across the Pacific or from elsewhere when something like this comes down. So there's that. And so that ha so that all mess happened just, just between when I, did my, when I recorded the video and when the video went live. Then two days, two days after that ha video came out, we won, asterisk. Wizards of the Coast announced through the Dungeon D&D Beyond uh, site that, you know, we're going to keep, like, we, we've heard the result responses, and overwhelmingly, the respondents to the poll objected to the changes in 1.2 and the uh, repeal 
on and re revocation of 1.0a. So we're going to keep the existing OGL and and put the system reference document for fifth edition out under a Creative Commons attribution license. That's the uh, Creative Commons 4.0 CC dash buy. And I will say up front, that is more than I expected by a long shot. What I, I, I expected them to keep the Creative Commons license in play. Like, well, give the OGL, like, best case scenario would be either, like, they keep either just, they, they keep 1.0a in place and just back out from their plans with the specter of the revocation of the license lingering over everyone's head. That was the most likely option, the most likely, most likely favorable option. My best case scenario was that they were going to put out a 1.0b, which had stronger language saying, um, this is actively irrevocable. We can't take it back. You can't take it back. No one can take it back until uh, the heat death of the universe, whatever the legal equivalent of that is. And oh, that's going to be what the best case scenario is. And with like, and like particularly with like that license, with them going okay, the three point five SRD, third edition SRD, and E twenty modern SRDs, all of which are basically over and done with. Those are all going to be on the uh, on the 1.0b, and we're still going to move forward with our new version of the 5.0 license, and that or the uh, 1.2 license, and we'll have some more adjustments to that. And fifth edition and D&D one will be under that license. That was what I thought was was the the most likely good situation that we could have gotten. So I was so seeing the Creative Commons license licensing of the fifth edition SRD was extraordinary. That was a like I had a had a holy crap moment um, right there in my uh, in in my room where I was, or on my computer. Like, did we win? We won. We're, we're not supposed to win. This is this is late stage capitalism. Um, our, if we get a victory, it's Pyrrhic. At best. <laughs> and so, then going through that and having a chance to settle down for a bit and have some takeaways from the whole thing. Just some light here for a bit. Uh, probably the biggest lighting, sh like the, uh, I think, takeaway from he me on this is that. Clearly, like the long-term campaign pushed back against the revocation of the OTL worked, and the fact that it got significant attention. Um, we cannot thank enough the coverage from IO9 on this issue, um, and the fact that that got the level of mainstream attention in Forbes, on CNBC, on ultimately that on NPR that that got this that got this under um, the attention of people beyond just the geek circle the people play tabletop role playing games um, Linda Codega their coverage was a big deal and I, and I mentioned them and called them out by name and used their correct pronouns because they are use they them um, is like when NPR did their coverage, um, Wizards got a soundbite. Wizards got a one-sentence soundbite. The rest of the coverage of the story was from a company who makes third-party products, who their response was basically that the 1.2 is better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick, but it's still not great. And with even more time going from Linda with the interview with, with them and making it clear it's better than a poke of the eye of the sharp stick, but you're still getting hit with a stick. It's still not great. People and people in the community aren't fooled by this and are upset and are up in arms. And this new story in particular, it wasn't just on the website where theoretically just gotten buried. This was on all things considered. 
one of NPR's flagship shows alongside like Morning Edition that is carried on every NPR station. So this was to a degree somewhat unavoidable, which means there's also a situation where you had like some studio executive with Paramount or whatever this, this, the um, studio is that's distributing the Dungeons and Dragons movie. I think it's Paramount. Driving home from work or in their office or whatever, listening to NPR, and they hear this story and go, what the actual, what the hell, what the shit? And like speed dial whoever their contact is at Hasbro to demand an explanation. Um, that is a reasonable situation response because like, and like that combined with on social media for like, if you looked at the comments on YouTube or Twitter or whatever social media platform you prefer about the trailers that were coming out for the new Dragons movie, like frequently in the comments, in fact, oftentimes very high and regularly in the comments was discussion of the changes to the OGL. And so in some cases, the effect of this looks great. I'm not necessarily going to go see this until things, until um, wizards unfucks themselves. And that I think was this was another of the big factors that push push this forward, and probably the third big one, strike three, if you will, is the fact that at this point, and we know this because of the recent er, of recent Hasbro earnings call, the only part of Hasbro that's making money right now is Wizards, um, and that earnings call, the figures from it were from the previous financial quarter before this all happened, and so it is not reflective. Of, for example, the massive cancellations of D&D Beyond subscriptions or the prospective sales of whatever their next book is, which I believe is a collection of heist themes adventures, um, what the response from to that book will be and how well it will sell. And again, on top of this, as I've mentioned, Wizards' business model at this point, as far as the Dungeons & Dragons line is concerned, is rather than doing what TSR did, where TSR um, ran themselves ragged, churning out tons of role-play source books and supplements and adventures for all of the campaign settings that they were running more or less concurrently. Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, um, Ravenloft, Dragonlance, Dark Sun, Planescape, Mistara, you name it. Spelljammer all of these in varying degrees of side by side rather than like spending so much money and splintering their market necessarily in that way by having yes you have a lot of dnd campaigns to, settings to choose from now um some of them are among the ones i've listed there uh forgotten realms um spell jammer dragon lance ravenloft in addition to uh, met the gathering base settings like uh, Ravnica and Strixhaven, that sort of thing. That, in spite of all of that, like they're not oh, an Eberron, of course. Um, almost forgot, almost forgot Eberron. But because of all, of, but yes, you have all of those settings available. But by opening them up to players under the Dungeon Masters Guild with wizards being able to take in some royalties from that as the as the condition of you get to play with our toys in turn we get to use that material if we think it's good and we get a cut of those sales because it's our setting it's our toys it's our sandbox it's it's, it's the, your cost for for getting to play in our environment in that regard then because of that Wizards is pulling in this money without necessarily having to do the significant outlaid costs and the outlay and the risk and facing the financial risk of we're going to put out 50 over the next five years, 50 source books and adventures for the Forgotten Realms. And we're going to put out 25 source books and adventures for Ravenloft. And we're going to put out 
15 generic uh, rule books for people who don't use those settings or the, all this, that, the other thing, all the, the lines um, of product that TSR had back in the second edition era. Now, someone who was playing D&D in that period and was looking at the TSR catalogs, you could see this massive uh, flow of material. Minor aside, if anyone has any of those, I would love to do a video going through some of those if they've been scanned and put up on the Internet Archive. If you have those and you haven't scanned those and put them up on the Archive and they're not there already, please do. Moving on. So, this was a big turnaround. This is definitely a win. But again, there is the asterisk there. We got the 5th edition system residence document under Creative Commons attribution license, not share alike, which means you don't have to put the other materials into the same Creative Commons license. Um, so you could just make D&D 5th edition compatible material and just sell it and not have to release it in, under Creative Commons yourself. Or make it open gaming comment, any portions of it open gaming content like under the OGL. You don't have to, it's not um, non-commercial license, which means you can make money off it. So that's good, but on the other asterisks, 3rd edition 3.5 and D20 Modern are not on, have not been creative have not been Creative Commons licensed. They're still under 1.0a, which has not been any way altered or updated or anything to make it more ironclad. And that's an issue if you are doing product that is more fifth or third edition inspired, or using rules or mechanisms or material from third edition, particularly like experience tables and that sort of thing. But we have explanation for a quick bit on this disclaimer: I'm not a lawyer. Um, Yes, you cannot copyright or trademark game mechanics, but you can copyright portions of the rules. And where this comes up for things like role-playing game stuff is if your role-playing game rules, if, for example, let's take the experience table, particularly since fifth edition, third edition and fifth edition, through fifth edition, I've all used a unified table. So take a minute, if you're watching this video, go ahead and grab your copy of the player's handbook. I have mine right here. So you go to page, let's see if we can find the experience point. No one will be seated during the exciting Alex pages through the player's handbook sequence. Yep. All right, 15. So we have here our, page 15, our experience point table. This is how many points you get it takes to go up a level in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Hypothetically, let's say our, uh, it, we, not even hypothetically, when this, when the SRD wasn't under the Creative Commons license, if Wizards of the Coast used a mathematical formula to determine the, the character points, that they went, okay, uh, First level is 300, then squared is 900, then then squared is 900 or whatever, like squared each time, or we're using a logarithmic scale and running it through a logarithmic um, formula to generate your character points for each level, then that would not be copyrighted. That would be something where, okay, anyone could have replicated the same formula for figuring out the right amount of experience points needed for advancement for a pace. However, if Wizards had gone, yeah, I took we started from that, but then we took the results and fiddled with them a bunch to make it more fun. And I said, oh yeah, like the, the formula um, that to that for seventh level, instead of tw twenty three thousand experience points, it's actually um, uh, twenty three hundred experience points with the formula that we started with, and so we decided to lop that down a bit. Or it was uh, three, or it was um, 29,000 uh, 29, experience points, or whatever. But they, they decided to make to use that formula as a starting point and then make a whole bunch of adjustments to where the results were because they feared it would be more fun in terms of what the end result would be. That point, you're no longer 
doing mathematical formula, you're making artistic decisions, and so to speak, and it's no and things get step out of what you can copyright or um, step into the territory, I should say, of what's protected by copyright. There's more to it than that. Not a lawyer, but that's kind of, that's kind of the idea for this sort of thing. Now, if you're um, doing your own role-playing game book, you can you can come up with your own table, or you can even just say, hey, use the um, advancement model of um, leveling up as the story, as it fits the story after a certain, a certain number of sessions, that sort of thing. That's what plenty of other systems do, like uh, Savage Worlds or uh, the World of Darkness or that sort of thing in terms of how you dole out advancement points. So... That's fine. So, like, that's a legit way to do it there too, and that mechanism certainly is not co would be less copyrightable. But for Dungeons and Dragons, but if you're doing something more OGL ish, no OGL, um, uh, old school Renaissance OSR related, then that's definitely more of a thing there. And so that's to get something point where having things Creative Commons licensed mattered. And similarly, if there's differences in, but there certainly are differences between your Creative Commons license or the, between your like experience table in third edition versus fifth edition, then, or other materials you're using, you're still kind of in a tight spot. And this could be from experience, and, and this could be something other than experience expansement. This could be uh, how save advancement works. This could be how the what the armor class bonuses are for different types of armor all those sorts of things so that's how things can so that that's the other side of the coin here and that's where i th would like to see wizards take further steps now again as of when i'm recording this this is itself on sunday the 29th so this is two days after the big Capitulation happened. I'm still taking this as a win, and we should take this as a win. But we haven't bested the dragon yet. We have forced the dragon to retreat to its cave and to lick its wounds. Um, the dragon may indeed in the future decide that this is perhaps not the best course of action to attack the settlement this, that is protected and to go elsewhere. Certainly in terms of other avenues where wizards can make money. Um, when they announced the D&D &D 1 initiative, they mentioned they're working on a virtual tabletop thing using Unreal Tournament 5 for handling things like lighting and 3D environments and that sort of thing. And there's certainly plenty of ways to nickel and dime the players to further monetize them through that regard by doing a, if it works, virtual tabletop that's flashier and grander in scope than anything that... Uh, Roll twenty, or its peers could like Fantasy Grounds has put out to date. That said, that doesn't mean it's going to be like, like that. Doesn't mean that that will work. And like this virtual tabletop initiative could end up stumbling and falling as what well, uh, falling. It could underperform. It could not work on. A variety of different types of net, uh, network connection. It could do well on FiOS and maybe some cable connections, but if you're on DSL, you could be out of luck. That sort of thing. But, and, and if that happens, wizards, or hat wizards may get a call from some executives at Hasbro saying, hey, we need you to make more money for us. And your new uh, v and your new v BTT initiative did not work out as planned. Um, we can't take advantage of that to try and drive more players that way, or drive third-party players that way as well. So we'll see. And, and so they, they, when that happens, they may decide. Well. We Creative Commons licensed the 5th edition rules. So if we retract the OGL again, maybe they won't be so mad. But we'll know when we get there. That'd be a lot. And 
we'll see how things go when we do get there. But in the meantime, again, we should celebrate the victory we have. We should make it clear to wizards that this was a step in the right direction in whatever means or whatever constructive mechanisms we deem necessary, we, we deem appropriate, whether it's going to see the movie, whether that's buying books or renewing our D&D Beyond subscriptions, whatever works for you and you feel comfortable doing. But we should also keep in mind that they could take this, that they could, well, there's some of it they can't take away. They can't retract this is SRD from the Creative Commons license. That's a nope, take backsies. There's other ways that they could backtrack on this and could end up leading to things not going well for third party publishers. So, a thing to keep in mind for you and your group, particularly if when your D&D game wraps up, maybe your current campaign comes to a close. Take a moment, look back at all this and say, you know, do we want to try something else for a bit? Or whatever, you, even if you want to do, just stick with Dungeon Fantasy. Um, trying something like Savage Worlds Pathfinder or Pathfinder 2nd Edition, um, GURPS Dungeon Fantasy, Rune Quest, uh, something like uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics, something else for the, on the Dungeon Fantasy front, or for that matter, stepping, trying your hand at other genres of game, whether it's uh, cinematic action like Feng, Feng Shui, particularly if you all watched John Wick and thought that was pretty darn awesome, or um, urban fantasy horror like the Chronicles of Darkness or you know new season of Mandalorian's out let's try Edge of the Empire whatever works for you trying a hand at something else just to see what else is out there and kind of figure out what your tastes are and expand your horizons beyond Dungeons and Dragons just a, th just a thought. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.